Welcome everyone to the third prophecy videos within this series on the wing tourney. In this prophecy series, we'll be looking at Littlefinger's plans for the tourney, Littlefinger's plans for Elaine, and how everything will fall apart. In the first video, we discussed Littlefinger's diplomatic options, and in the second video, we discussed how Westerosi tourneys work, covering most of the basic rules. Then we discussed how the upcoming tourney will most likely be organized, that is, with a single elimination bracket. That's where we're at currently. Before we start, minor spoilers warning for the books and possible spoilers for the Winds of Winter. If you care about things getting spoiled, don't watch this video. Now, as I said in the previous video, single elimination brackets still have problems, especially in medieval times. But first a short reminder, how will the upcoming tourney most likely be organized? Well, a bracket is a system in which everyone fights against set opponents moving forward each round. The bracket then decides who your next opponent will be, leaving zero freedom to the players. Single elimination means that if you lose, you're out. This is great for a lot of reasons, but most importantly it's really easy for us as the audience to understand. The tourney itself is probably going to be quite an important plot point, so it's crucial that we understand what's going on. Now this tourney also has another interesting rule. There are 8 winners. This means that if you are far enough into the bracket, you win. In this case there are 64 participants, which means that you can pretty much divide the entire tourney into these 8 equal squares. As I said, this still has some problems and unclarities. In this video, we'll discuss what is probably the most important unclarity, placement. In other words, where will the participants be placed in the bracket? There are many options for this, so let's go through them all. To start, seeding. Seeding is the process of placing everyone in certain spots based on their skill. This means that everyone is listed in a list from best to worst, and then everyone is placed on their corresponding spots. In modern seeding, this is designed to give the best players, in other words, the people highest on the lists, the highest chance to win. This is done by making sure that the better you are, the worse your opponent will be, which would oddly equate to, the better you are, the higher your chances of winning. Now, seeding is a great mathematical way to create brackets, but this is almost impossible to do in medieval times. Because the thing is, to do this, you need a list of everyone from worst to best. That's what this entire process is based on, and that's what makes this process fair. This means that if you cannot get a fair list, you cannot get a fair bracket. Remember, the system is designed to make sure that the people highest on the list, in other words, the people with the highest seeding, fight against the worst opponents. This means that the higher your seeding, the higher your chances of winning, even if your skill remains the same. Which means that if someone gets an unfairly high seeding, they get an unfair advantage. Seeding only works if you can get a fair list. And can you, in medieval times, get a fair list? No. Because the thing is, the modern lists are calculated based on your previous performances. But in medieval times, you don't have these formulas, and you don't have a fair list of everyone's previous performances. Which means that these lists have to be completely based on personal opinions. Realistically, such a list is logistically impossible. But, okay, let's say that Littlefinger is an all-knowing god who knows everything about everyone, and uses this to make the perfect list that literally everyone agrees with. Seeding will still not work, because the thing is, the entire point of the system is to make sure that the best people have an extra advantage, while the worst people are dug deeper into their graves. And because losing attorney is pretty much losing your entire wealth, people won't like this, the worst 20-ish people would probably all go around complaining that the system was rigged against them. Because the system was rigged against them. That's the second big problem with seeding. It doesn't give an illusion of fairness. People want to believe that everyone has at least a chance of winning, but with seeding that's simply not true and provably so. 
it's easy to argue that the worst person fighting the best person isn't quote unquote fair, because from a certain perspective, it isn't. So if you're the worst 20 to 40 to 90%, of course you'd argue against this system. The next big problem with seating in medieval times is the illusion of integrity. Because the thing is, seating is actually quite easy to rig. You just move one person up some spaces and another down some spaces, slowly changing the list till you get a quite certain outcome. Is this easy to get away with? No, not really. But it is possible, and it is easy to understand that it is possible. Which means that there will always be people claiming you cheated. How many people will claim you're cheating? Well, that depends on the illusion of integrity of the system. What is a system with a high illusion of integrity? Well, it's a system that people trust. For example, a random draw. Even though you could be drawing the cards out of your sleeve, a random draw still feels fair and integer. On the other hand, a system with low illusion of integrity would be placing everyone where you want them to be. That would of course be extremely easily riggable and not at all integer. I hope that was anywhere close to understandable. Now, how does seeding rank on this scale of integrity? I'd say somewhere in the middle. It's not super easily riggable, but it is possible. So I'll give it a meh. The final big problem with using seeding in this situation is that interesting fights generally happen later in the tourney. This is because the best people will always fight the worst people, which means that until they are the only ones remaining, they can't fight each other. For our example with 64 players, the first remotely interesting fight for our best player would be in the quarterfinals against the 8th best player. Then he fights the 4th best player and lastly the 2nd best player. This is of course assuming that the better player always wins, which isn't always the case. Now, this is great, because normally, that's what you want. You want these final matches to be the most interesting. But, in the case of this tourney, our winners will already be decided before the quarterfinals. Remember, we have 8 winners, which means that all the players remaining in the quarterfinals are our 8 winners. This means that the best few players won't have any hard fights at all. Not only is this extremely bad for an illusion of fairness, it's also bad because there won't be any interesting fights. This is bad for a lot of reasons you can probably come up with yourself, so let's move on. There is one last criteria we'll be judging these systems on. Rigability. In other words, how easily can Littlefinger rig the system? Now you might be like, Hey, but isn't integrity the same as rigability? Well, no. For example, deciding everything by rolling dice has an extremely high illusion of integrity, but it's still extremely riggable by, for example, switching out the dice to assert certain victories. I'll come to you with some more examples later, which will hopefully clear up any questions you might have surrounding these factors, but for now, no they're not the same. So, those are the five criteria I'll keep in mind when judging these different systems. So let's look at seeding again, with these five criteria. Seeding is logistically impossible, it doesn't give an illusion of fairness, it gives an okay illusion of integrity, it intentionally avoids interesting fights, and is quite hard to rig. So yeah, seeding is really bad within this context. I think it was quite obvious from the very beginning that seeding is not gonna happen. So what is? Well the next possibility I want to discuss is Littlefinger placing everyone exactly where he wants them to be. Now this seems really weird, because no one is going to accept this, right? Well it does have some really good advantages. If you're placing everyone where he wants them, everything is logistically possible. With the right setup, it can give an illusion of fairness and can create interesting fights. And of course, it's extremely easy to rig. The problem here is, of course, that it doesn't give an illusion of integrity. But 
that's solvable. The thing is, in a bracket there are two layers of placement. The first is obvious, who your opponent will be in the first round. But you and your opponent can be here, or here, or here. That's the second layer of placement, where you are in the tourney. And this second layer is something that Littlefinger, with almost every system, has full control over. Because unless a system is really strict, like seating, nothing decides how people are placed. This means that Littlefinger can still place people where he wants them to be, without breaking the illusion of integrity. Now is this second layer important? Yes, obviously. Because you can only face the 7 players in your box. The other 56 players are suddenly not important anymore. Even if Littlefinger might not have full control over who your first opponent might be, he can still make sure that, after your first fight, you'll have an easy victory. And let's be real, these first fights are often still riggable, so even with only total control over the second layer, he can still force certain victories. So that's my expectation. I expect that Littlefinger will use another system to decide who fights for the first fight, and then Littlefinger will place everyone the way he wants them to, to ensure certain victories. Now, there are also other things Littlefinger can do to increase the illusion of integrity. He could get someone else to reveal the bracket, for example. If that person is trustworthy, their unveiling of the bracket would make the entire bracket seem more trustworthy. And because I expect the brackets will be handed out in pamphlets or posters, something that would be even better is if he could get trustworthy people to sign those pamphlets or posters. If he could, for example, get Lady Wainwood and Nestor Royce to sign, which is quite realistic I might add, then it'd be a great sign of them agreeing with the bracket. I'd expect this to be enough to silence pretty much any opposition. But, if Littlefinger wants to create even more of an illusion of integrity, then he could possibly have someone else create the list for him, or maybe a group of people including him. The ideal person for this would have of course been Lysa, because the rigability wouldn't go down at all, and the integrity would only go up. But of course, Lysa is dead, so does Littlefinger have other options? Well, maybe Nestor Royce, but personally, I don't think he'd do that for Littlefinger. And it would give Littlefinger more risk and less clean hands, which is something he doesn't really need by now. So, maybe he will do this, but I don't think so. I think he, with all the factors we discussed above, already has enough illusion of integrity that such a thing wouldn't be worth it. It'd just be an unnecessary risk with an extremely low reward. Quite unrealistic if you ask me, but a possibility to keep in mind nonetheless. So that's our second layer. But how will we do the first layer? How will we decide who fights who in the first round? As we saw in the beginning, mathematically or logically based systems don't really work. There are a lot of them, but to my knowledge they all have pretty much the same problems as seeding. Then placing things yourself doesn't really work either, because people can easily say, hey, that's not fair. So that leaves us with two options in my knowledge, letting the participants choose and letting randomness choose. Let's begin with the former. Letting participants choose seems great, except how could you possibly do that in a fair way? Maybe first come first serve, but that isn't really fair. Or you could choose people randomly who then get to choose their opponent. But logistically, that's a nightmare. But even if you can come up with something that's logistically possible and gives an illusion of fairness, you still have a system that isn't easy to rig and doesn't have much of an illusion of integrity and doesn't necessarily create interesting fights. It's okay on everything, but I think the biggest problem is that it gives the participants the freedom to utterly 
ruin Littlefinger's plans. You'd only need one skilled person to challenge the wrong person and boom, everything crumbles. It could work, but I don't think it'll happen. Way too much risk. Now, randomness is actually great. There are a ton of ways to create randomness or to create semi-randomness or to fake randomness. So it's always logistically possible, even if you only have a single coin. With a single coin, Littlefinger would have to do more than 200 coin flips and master all of them. So logistically possible, not necessarily realistic. But not only that, randomness is undeniably fair and integer. It can create interesting fights and is often quite riggable. Especially if you make it godly in some way, shape or form, no one is going to question it. And even if it doesn't create interesting fights, no one will blame you, and you can still make sure that interesting fights happen in later rounds. And because these quote-unquote random things are often not actually random, they can be quite riggable. As I said, there are a million and one ways to do randomness. From drawing straws, to rolling dice, to game show-like ordeals. But which one specifically, and how Littlefinger can rig it, is something for another day. For now, the most important note is, this is what I expect will happen. Some form of randomness will decide the first fights, and Littlefinger will decide everything else. Now this answers one of the questions about the upcoming turn, but there is still a lot remaining. All those and more will be answered in the rest of this prophecy series on the Veil. Hello everyone, thank you so much for watching, I really appreciate it. If you enjoyed the video, feel free to leave a like. If you didn't enjoy the video, feel free to leave a dislike. If you disagree, feel free to leave a comment down below. And of course, if you want to see more, feel free to subscribe. Thank you so incredibly much for watching. Have a great day.